Hello, everyone, and welcome to our monthly webinar. Um, we've been talking a lot about energy storage recently here at Two Green Energy, and I thought I would do well to broaden the conversation a little bit beyond the types of things we've been covering, zinc air uh, batteries and pumped hydro and uh, compressed air energy storage and so forth. Um, this is a presentation that's going to be delivered by a friend of a friend, soon to become a direct friend, I guess I could say, I, at least I hope. Jim Kelly is uh, the CEO of Advanced Rail Energy Storage, uh, pronounced Aries, right, Jim? Correct. Yes. Well, Jim, welcome, and uh, we we're thrilled to have you here. Well, thank you, Craig. I appreciate the invitation, and we look forward to sharing a little bit about our vision here and, and how it uh, came to be. Okay, good. Now, uh, as you probably are aware, I'm an advocate of storage for a great number of reasons, and I think a lot of it is explicit in this presentation itself, which I've seen. Um, but we, I, we might want to talk a little bit more about the imperative of storage as a kind of grid-related asset in a world that becomes increasingly hungry to implement larger, to integrate larger and larger amounts of of variable resources like solar and wind. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and oh, you should also know, <clears throat> I don't want to make this sound like I've set you up for trouble, uh, but that, you know, I'm an advocate for the listener. So don't, I mean, you know that I'm a fair-minded guy and that I know something about this subject. Um, and But don't expect me to be completely docile because I know in advance from having spoken with a great number of our um, you know, if you, I don't know whether you read the blog at twogreenenergy.com, but it's fairly lively, and I've been promoting this thing a little bit in advance, and a few people have pushed back in a few different directions. But anyway, we'll come, I mean, in other words, they're, they're challenging this thing as an idea, the, not necessarily the theoretical um, practicality of it. In other words, there, there's nobody suggesting that it's theoretically impossible. They're just saying that for various reasons it won't, it wouldn't be cost effective in this, this, and this situation. But anyway, I'll just at the appropriate time I'll just chime in on their behalf. Fair enough? Sure, you bet. And we we uh, we appreciate uh, uh, critical input. Uh, this has been a, a, an amazing journey for us uh, coming up with this this technology. It was really motivated by uh, the fact that all of us involved with ARIES have, um, have sort of long uh, histories of environmental involvement in various different ways. And, uh, and we were looking for a solution to a thorny problem that was mm -hmm. environmentally responsible. And we'll, and we'll tell you more about that as we go. Well, very good. But before we jump into the technology, um, and it's interesting that you mentioned the background of the team, and you may know that I've met a few of these people. Uh, actually, I was introduced to Aries through a mutual friend, John Tyson, who's an investor in the company. Um, and I spent a very interesting day. I guess it was before you joined the team, and I'm trying to think of when this could have been, a year, maybe 18 months ago, um, in a presentation where I first came across this. Um, so, but in any case, and I, so my point is that I've met a number of your people, but I, but I don't know anything per, in, outside of what I've read in summary fashion on uh, your website about your specific background. Do you want to give us a little quick thumbnail sketch on that? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm sort of an unlikely environmental advocate, I suppose, uh, on the face of things. Uh, it might surprise people that I consider myself an environmental advocate, but I spent my entire professional career, 38 years, with Southern California Edison, one of the largest investor-owned utilities in the country. And believe it or not, folks, uh, uh, those two statements are not mutually exclusive. Uh, there are a lot of us in the utility space who have a deep personal commitment to the environment and who have spent a lot of years and a lot of money and a lot of personal investment trying to make things better. And, uh, and, and my career uh, w was sort of all over the company, but, but I spent uh, many years uh, in, in the regulatory and environmental part of, of the company. Uh, I ended up as Vice President of Regulatory and Environmental for Southern California Edison. And then I went from there back sort of to my first love and was Vice President of Engineering and also of Advanced Technology, our analog to research and development at the utility for quite some time. And then the last several years of my career, uh, I was responsible for uh, uh, leading and, and managing the operation of Southern California Edison's 50,000 square mile grid. I was Senior Vice President of Transmission and Distribution. 
responsible for 100,000 miles uh, plus of distribution circuits, about 12,000 miles of high voltage transmission, about 900 substations, about 8,000 employees, uh, wow. and it was a, a great a great job. 38 years was long enough, and and when I uh, retired from Edison, at the close of that career, I took on an encore career, really spending most of my time pursuing. Uh, ideas that I think will make a difference for the grid and for consumers, particularly ideas that I think will enable both a smarter grid and a cleaner grid. And Aries was one of those. I, I actually first got involved with Aries, oh, about four years ago, uh, when when the inventor of of the Aries idea started talking to me uh, as a result of actually of a talk I was giving on Smart Grid at a local university, and, and we got into a dialogue, and I was so um, attracted by, uh, by what we were trying to achieve with Aries that I actually, post-retirement, for quite some time, uh, worked, for, uh, worked for Aries uh, pro bono to try to develop the idea. And then ultimately, the board asked me if I would come on and, and, and help lead the effort, and, and I agreed to do so. So I've been working with Aries for a long time as we've tried to develop it, and and we've gotten it to a point now where we think it's uh, it's pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. Well, that's neat. And by the before we jump into this thing, let me just say, just taking off on what you said about the non mutual exclusivity of profit and environmentalism, um, I, I ran across somebody told me the other day. If it's, if it's not profitable, it's not sustainable. In other words, it's not going to happen anyway. So you might as well focus on what works in terms of driving uh, monetary success. If, in other words, if, it, if it's not going to be financially attractive, it's not going to happen regardless of how cool you happen to think it is, Craig. <laughs> yeah, so. I think that's exactly right, and those are, are, are definitely not mutually exclusive. We believe that you can do things uh, that you can do well by doing good, to use a, an old way, and, uh, and that ultimately uh, I like to say when I give uh, uh, presentations to various groups, I like to say that in the in the very short term, bad public policy can overcome good science, but in the long run, science always wins. Yes, you well, good. We, you you we, can't hold up you can't hold up bad science forever with subsidies or or with bad policy. Ultimately, yeah. the idea has got to stand on its own, and that's what we're trying to do here. Good. All right. Well, let's take a look at this. On this first slide, um, you know, the, the proverbial picture being worth a thousand words. So what do we have here? Yeah, well, I, I guess I'm going to give you a, a preface that maybe helps this make more sense to, to all, of, uh, all of our participants here today. Uh, you know, the problem that we were trying to solve, and we'll talk more about it, was that we knew there was a need for large-scale energy storage. Um, and, and we knew that this was really critical to eventually allowing the grid, both in the U.S. and around the world, to integrate much more renewable power. The fundamental problem here, and your, and your participants know all about it, I'm sure, is that renewable power, for the most part, we're talking about wind and solar, um, are fundamentally stochastic, that is, intermittent. They are as intermittent as the, as the sun and the wind that powers them. The problem is that the demand of consumers is not uh, easily tailored to when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining. They want power when they need it to run their lives, their businesses, the commerce that, that we all use uh, in, in our daily lives. And, and so the only way that you can integrate really large quantities of fundamentally intermittent resources is to have storage available. And storage comes in all kinds of flavors. We, we do not view ourselves, for example, as being a competitor to batteries or flywheels. Not at all. Um, we think we're complements. They're better suited to smaller applications that are closer to the customer. We really needed a solution for grid scale, really at the transmission level. How could we provide stability and storage? And the best solution out there today has been, for many years, pump storage hydroelectric. We love pump storage. Um, I helped build the last significant pump storage hydro facility in the state of California. 
Uh, it's a wonderful facility. I'm very proud of it. Um, the problem we found in, uh, uh, with pump storage hydro is that because it requires water, it's difficult in arid areas, and because it requires the impounding of water, it's very, very difficult, expensive, and time-consuming to permit pump storage. People are now saying 10 to 15 years is typical to permit and license a pump storage facility before you can start building it. So what we tried to do was come up with a, with a way to mimic the performance of pump storage hydroelectric without water. And that's what ARIES really is. As you know, in pump storage hydro, you typically have an upper reservoir, which they call a four bay. You have a lower reservoir, which is separated by elevation difference, uh, which is called an after bay. And in between, you typically have tunnels or pipes called penstocks that transport the water from the top to the bottom, then push it back up off peak to the upper reservoir. We wanted to get that same performance, same characteristics using the force of gravity, but without water. Hence, we developed ARIES, which basically uses a long proven technology, electric locomotives, to simply move masses from an upper rail yard, that's our four bay, down tracks, that's our penstocks, to a lower rail yard, that's our after bay. And in that way, using the power of gravity, get the same kind of performance characteristics we get out of pump storage hydro. So we simply put masses, concrete blocks is the easy way to think of them, behind the electric locomotive. When the locomotive comes down the grade at a controlled rate, it generates electricity using a motor generator. When it goes up the grade, it stores electricity, right, using it as a motor. Right. This, this slide to which I've just skipped here, slide three, kind of speaks to that, I believe. Yep. And what we found uh, to, our, uh, to our delight as we looked at this was that we could get the same performance as pump storage, in fact, with regard to some characteristics, better performance at a lower capital cost, which was important when we looked at the economics. But most important to us was no emissions, no hazardous substance, no impounding of waters, no dams, no tunnels, no pipes. We sit lightly on the land. When you're done with an ARIES installation in however many years you run it, you pull up the railroad tracks, you throw out some grass seed, you rake the site and water it, and you never know we were there. That That's was amazing. really to us. Yep. Good. Here's, by the way, a little comparison to uh, pumped storage. I probably should have put that up a second ago. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we kind of like this one. And again, we like pump storage. It is far and away the preeminence worldwide, uh, world leader in energy storage uh, uh, technology. It, it, it does a, a wonderful job where you have the right topography and you have water and you can get it permitted. We serve to, to, to do the same thing in those areas where you can't do those because we don't require water or dams. We can be built quickly, less expensively. We're a little more efficient as well. And the technology is proven. We've combined sort of the best in electric locomotive technology with the best in power electronics and control technology to use this as a storage medium. Well, it's interesting you ask that. And while I'm asking this question, let me just show this next slide because it has a little bit more um, photography on it. But um, <clears throat> I was wondering, this, you know, I'm not a patent attorney, that's for sure. Um, but I'm wondering what is patentable about this. And when you mention power electronics, I guess there's, that may be the answer. It would strike me that if you say I want a patent on moving heavy stuff up and down hills, I think the patent office is going to tell you to take a hike. But well, I may be actually, wrong. Actually, they didn't. Actually, they didn't. We have a, a, a patent, uh, international patent in, I think we're at 53 countries now, including the U.S., mm -hmm. for the Aries Energy Storage System that combines all of these things. And then we have a couple of additional add-on patents uh, pending right now for some of our secret sauce in terms of power electronics that we use to control and synchronize the system. So in fact, it, it, it is patentable, and we have patented it. Uh, well, and very good. Yeah. Very good. So, OK, here, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, go, go back one, Craig, because I do want to point out one important thing here, if you can. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, you, you see two different conceptions here. 
the picture that you see on your left is of a large-scale energy storage facility. This is a facility that is, that is literally taking, for example, wind in the middle of the night when, as uh, many of your listeners know, uh, it is uh, at times right now we have excess generation because of wind power at night. It has to be curtailed. Uh, and, and instead of wasting that power or sowing the blades of the windmill, we move our masses up the hill when there's excess capacity and, and, uh, and demand is low, and we bring them down the next day so that we turn wind, for example, into dispatchable, on-peak, baseload kinds of generation where it looks for all the world to the grid as though it was a traditional steam plant fi fired by coal or natural gas or nuclear fuel. Yes. So we provide that reliable output. But you'll note on the right, one of the interesting things we found as we developed this is that we could also build smaller scale ARIES facilities that provide ancillary services to the grid because as we have more and more renewables and less and less traditional fossil fire generation, we, we start to lose some of the more esoteric but important characteristics like uh, uh, VAR support, uh, inertia to the grid, megawatt second of, of inertia, uh, and, and also the ability to control voltage and frequency, which spinning mass generators, traditional steam generators, do very easily, but windmills and photovoltaic cells don't do. Right. So we're able to also put in small ancillary services systems where we simply put the loaded cars at the middle of the grade and oscillate them up and down upon commands from a regional transmission organization like the California ISO to provide frequency support, voltage support, spinning reserves, bar support, inertia, black start, and all of the other things that go with the provision of electricity that people don't think about but are really important to keeping the lights on. Yes, um, they're important from a consumer uh, perspective, but I th think they're also uh, important from your perspective. I would think that there's a lot of noise being made recently about paying making sure that the whole economics of the grid recognizes the extreme value brought by dispatchable power and in fact these types of ancillary services isn't there this, this is a big deal in today's you know um, financial conversations isn't it yeah it's an increasingly big deal and in fact the first commercial aries a facility that we're going to build. We have a proof of concept facility, but the first commercial facility will actually be uh, quite similar to the conception you see on the right there, a 50 megawatt ancillary services machine, because you can make an attractive return to your investors immediately by selling those ancillary services into the grid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, okay, well good. Now this next slide has to do with a little bit more about the you know, the way this whole thing works. Yeah, and, and this, this basically just emphasizes that there's low technology risk here because we use uh, uh, proven technology, proven heavy haul rail components. Rail bed design is well known. It's been done all over the world for a century. Electric locomotives are highly developed. Um, the, uh, the specifications we use because the, the, the more we can haul heavy masses up and down, uh, the, the more efficient we can be. We use the same sort of standards that are being used every day right now in Australia for heavy haul ore mining equipment. Uh, the, the, the strongest um, rail equipment that, that hauls the heaviest in terms of per axle load in the world right now is being used as we speak in Australia. So we're just taking that same technology and applying it here to haul masses up and down. We don't need any science breakthroughs. No new electrochemical developments, no superconductivity, no new science. Those are all great things and we support them and I work on them, but we don't need any of those to do ARIES. No, not at all. And as a matter of fact, this next slide kind of speaks to that. Um, and as a matter of fact, that was the comment that I made when I first saw this. Um, and my concern I don't doubt that there's a, a window of opportunity for this. I, I, and I, I say window because I think that the window is or will soon be open as we recognize the importance of grid-scale storage, and we haven't developed 
um, superior technology, and, and no offense, but I mean, w when I first saw this, I go, well, this is technology that is a combination of what Newton found in 1660 and what Faraday found in 1831 or something like that. So in other words, and I I'm, I'm, I'm shouldn't you know, trivialize this thing because I know there's a lot of, of 21st century technology on top of this thing that makes it, that enables it to do what it does. But the point is that I think, uh, you know, many decades hence, uh, batteries, it's, well, batteries is probably the best, most obvious example, but I think we'll probably get there in terms of utility scale batteries at a certain point. Um, your point, however, is, and you could argue with me on that, and you could also say, well, that's a heck of a long way down the trail. Yeah, well, I mean, I, we, we, we at Aries think you're spot on, and we look forward to those uh, ultra-advanced battery technologies, for example. I, I work with, uh, with some of the scholars at Caltech, for example, who are doing phenomenal things in the lab. And we believe that decades down the road, there will be incredible breakthroughs in fundamental material science and thermodynamics and physics that will change the equations. Right now, what we're faced with is that Batteries have relatively low energy density, they're relatively expensive, and many of them, not all, have big environmental impacts. I mean, you can despoil whole areas of third world countries mining for lithium. You can develop batteries that have high energy density, but if they break open, everyone nearby might die from them because of the toxics. Um, they're difficult to dispose of. Will we eventually have battery technology that is uh, entirely safe, has very high density, doesn't require materials that, that, that have huge environmental footprints. Yeah, I think we will. Um, and we look forward to that. But you know, the problem is America and the world has waited, have waited long enough for renewable energy. Um, we don't want the absence of storage to, to, pardon the pun, but to derail this train and cause us to wait. Um, so what, what we offer, we, we, we would never presuppose to say we are the ultimate solution, but we're a solution that you could, you could start deploying tomorrow that will help the U.S. get to very high levels of renewables with very high reliability and safety with virtually no environmental impacts other than, than the environmental impacts of laying a railroad track. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, we're supporters of all that research. We participate. We donate to it. We put our time into it. But, you know, we're using a, a solution that we think here is very elegant simply because it does rely on, on proven stuff. It does rely on Newton and Faraday. Those are a couple of heroes of mine and probably yours as well. Um, so we're, we're not doing breakthrough science. We're solving a problem here. Good. Well, that's fine with me. I've always said, not to get philosophic, but, you know, I'm not sure we need great new ideas. I think the world, the, when you think about the world since uh, the time of Socrates, 2,500 years ago, there, we've got a lot of great ideas around here, whether they're philosophic or scientific or mathematic or architectural or humanitarian or whatever. We just need people to implement them. And, and now we desperately need people to implement them because we're at a, phase, at a time in human evolution and civilization that we're kind of running out of time. We're up against the wall in terms of our population quintupling from 1950 to 2050. It will quintuple from 2 billion to 10 billion. Um, and needless to say, we're more and more uh, energy hungry per capita. Um, and the effects of all of this, of providing this huge energy-hungry population with all the energy it needs, has, taken, has begun to take a terrible toll on the uh, environment. It seems that way to me, anyway. You're preaching to the choir, my friend. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Now, before we move on, into the, I guess we've covered this. Are there any technical points here you'd like to make before you see the next slide? No, simply that, you know, we, we, we've we taken these components. We, we really do an adapt and adopt kind of strategy here. This is not breakthrough research. Um, the components that we needed to assemble were well known, although often for different applications in different industries. We've added some, some magic of our own in terms of the way we direct sync to the grid while in motion, the way we dispatch the cars and so forth. But, uh, but 
fundamentally we're using things that have been proven in other applications um, uh, many times. So we take the technology risk out of this thing. Mm -hmm. Neat. Very good. Okay, and here's the next one. Talking and this about one, Go ahead. yeah, this one we've sort of talked about, Craig, but you know, what we, we, we're getting a, a grid which is increasingly unstable simply because of the fundamental instability uh, of, of renewable resources. We love them, but they are fundamentally in, unstable. And ultimately, you know, you can only take out so much of that instability by what we call non-coincident variability. If I put my wind farms far enough apart, the hope is the wind will blow in one place if it's not blowing in the other. But still, there's only so much I can do with non-coincident variability. And, and I've got to have a way I can keep the lights on and keep the schools open and the hospitals running and the factories running and, and commerce happening for everybody. And, 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 we, and we help smooth that out and we provide those other characteristics that keep the grid stable and keep the power moving. So as we expand renewables, we have an increasing need, and I think most of your listeners get that, for cost-effective and environmentally responsible energy storage and ancillary services. We like to say we're the green way to store green power. Oh, good. Clever idea. Um, here's a little bit of the uh, math and physics. Mm -hmm. And um, this basically is, is, is a, based on a, a computer simulation. Uh, now we're getting real data because we actually have an ARIES test bed site in, in Tehachapi where we are moving masses on an electric locomotive up and down slope and gathering data. But when we, when we simulate this, basically uh, we look at a, a, a different cost-effective modules. And, and this was a simulation for a, a very nice size, we think, for a regional energy storage hub. 668 megawatts happens to be how it came out. And we could discharge for eight hours here. If, you, if, if the system operator wanted us to, we could, di we could discharge uh, uh, greater or lesser times at, at more or less power depending on what the grid needed. But this is one sample. And this would be two rail yards, 3,000 foot elevation differential, about eight miles of track, five interconnecting tracks. So we're not talking about hundreds of tracks. We're talking about five tracks wide. Mm -hmm. that would move rail cars up and down from an upper rail yard to a lower rail yard. That would be 140 four-car shuttle units. Our basic unit for Ares is a four-car unit. Um, and that unit, which contains each one of those, has about two megawatt hours of, of, of energy capacity in them. And here we'd simply move the concrete masses up and down to provide 668 megawatts of energy storage. Okay. Now, here's a couple of questions about this thing. So, the, when you look at this theoretical um, piece, so if this is an artist rendering with some math. I mean, this couldn't possibly be wrong because of the basic, you know, uh, it is true that energy equals, you know, mgh. So, in other words, a certain mass times the acceleration of gravity times a certain height is going to give you a certain number of megawatt hours. No dispute there. You can dispute the efficiency, and this, I'm sure, what this must be close to, this must be over 80%. This could be over 90%. Yeah, depending on how you use it. When you use it as an ancillary services machine, you get efficiencies just north of 80 or of 90%. When you use it in energy storage, you, you get efficiencies that, that hover around 80%, which is actually a little bit better than what pump storage uh, uh, typically is able to achieve. Okay. Uh, incidentally, why is it better in the ancillary services thing? Uh, because we don't have to, we can leave the loaded cars um, on the grade and simply oscillate them up and down on command. We don't have to stage them at the top and the bottom and uh, move them to the edge and bring them down. We leave them actually on the slope for ancillary amazing. service. Amazing. Very good. Um, and that must be a little bit of logistics too when you think about um, you know, uh, robotics that I, I'm thinking about all these cool things that you see where, you know, automated factories and so forth. In other words, moving that stuff around at the top and the bottom must be very interesting to watch. It, indeed, indeed. And, and, you know, there are people who have expressed concerns about the control systems, and I guess I'd, I'd, I'd throw in a couple of, of factors for people to think about. 
the first is that you know we have railroads with enormous uh, uh, loads on them moving all over America and the world, and nobody worries too much about whether you can stop them. But I will tell you that we have uh, four redundant braking systems built into an Aries car, including the demo car that we're that we're experimenting with now, so that uh, that if all else fails. Uh, uh, these these cars stop themselves. They're designed to stop, not go. Uh, normally closed, if you will. And you have to actually actuate them to let them move. Thank so you. we have full safety features. The other thing is, people say, "Oh my gosh, electronically controlling unmanned rail vehicles sounds really hard." And my answer is, uh, if you've been to almost any major metropolitan airport recently in the world. You didn't think twice when you got on an entirely unmanned rail, electric rail shuttle right. and it took you to the plane or to the rental car area, and yeah. you didn't worry about it a bit. And it's exactly the same kind of control protocol. It's just that we respond to grid operator calls instead of to passengers. Yes, that makes sense. I don't think anybody – well, anyway, I don't think that's a serious challenge to this. But um, what about sighting? When, you, when I look at this thing and I see the artist rendering, I go – and I see this 7.5% grade and the eight miles in length and so forth. I go, that's cool, but you're not going to be building a mountain, so you better find yourself a mountain that's not too steep, but it's steep enough, it's long enough, it's close enough, it's not, you know, 1,000 miles from a population center, et cetera. Do, do, do you have uh, heartburn about sighting? Well, what, what we've found, we've developed some sophisticated tools. It's, it's become a lot easier in the last few years using Google Maps and USGS overlays and so forth. And, and we found that there's an a abundance of good area sites, particularly in the more arid parts of the world, whether you look at, at Western China, you look at the, at the Western United States. Mm -hmm. um, we find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, in fact thousands worldwide, of great area sites because area sites are particularly well suited uh, to gentle slopes. Right. These are, are typically between, uh, you know, the sweet spot for Aries is about 6 to 8% slope mm -hmm. for energy storage. And, and long, relatively uh, flat, not undulating terrain. And this is a, a, a geographical formation called an alluvial fan. Uh, and, and it turns out that alluvial fans are incredibly common, particularly in arid areas. If you go to Nevada, for example, um, Nevada is just surrounded by alluvial fans that go on for miles and miles at constant grade, gentle grade. Um, so they're, they're, uh, they're really, really very common formations. Uh, we don't require high mountains. Uh, we require gentle slopes. Uh, if you're standing, uh, if you're in uh, Pahrump, Nevada, for example, uh, and you look up at the, uh, at the hillsides, you will see mile after mile after mile of gentle alluvial fans that uh, make my mouth water because they're perfect area sites. Okay. Well, um, having said that, and I, you come from the T and D business as well, so you must be aware that we don't have the um, high voltage DC, you know, cross continental um, transmission grid that we wish we did. Um, so the fact that this is in Parup, Nevada, is, I don't know whether I got that right or not, like P U R U P or something. Um, you know, I don't. That's probably a heck of a long way from San Francisco and Los Angeles. But it but it so happens that that location uh, is encircled by uh, high voltage transmission and substations, okay. all of which all of which are connected not only to the Nevada grid but to the California grid to oh, the Valley. Good. Yeah. So simply by putting it right there, you can move power into Nevada or throughout California through the existing transmission system. So one of the things we look for when we try to site Aries is we look for areas that are, are reasonably close to high voltage transmission. I would and uh, there's a lot of them. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. Well, here's just one more thing about the way these things move around. Um, is there anything you want to say about that before we go on? Oh, well, the only thing here is, uh, this is kind of a, of, of a clever little structure, is we, uh, we stack the masses uh, sideways and then we do a lift and twist using a simple hydraulic ram. 
And the, and the reason we do this is not because it's required to do energy storage. Uh, in fact, it actually costs a little more. The reason you do it this way is to minimize the amount of land you have to use because, again, we want to sit lightly on the land. We want to minimize the, the acreage that we actually use for Aries facilities. Even though this is completely benign, it's concrete masses sitting on K-Rail, we try to stack close so we don't have to use any more land than is required here. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. Um, especially from the standpoint of um, the nature conser conservancy. Um, and not to digress and throw this thing off, but I, w I have to say that I was amused. I don't think we've, we've spoken about this thing since the, I was down in um, Los Angeles the other day um, at a meeting of the Nature Conservancy where this woman went off on solar PV in the desert for 15 minutes. She was talking about how horrible um, the, uh, you know, the deportation of the desert, desert tortoise and so forth and so on. And at a certain point, I raised my hand and I said, you, you know, can't we go after coal? I mean, we all live on the same planet. There, there are seven billion of us who are starting to choke to death. We're not, I don't, I'm not sure PV is the biggest threat to our survival here, lady. I was a little yeah. bit more polite, but not much. Uh, ultimately, Craig, I, I mean, I think we all realize, at least those of us who have who have backgrounds in, in, in science, we all recognize that everything we do every day has some environmental impact, including breathing. Yep. The question here is, is there a reasonable way that we can minimize that impact, mitigate to the degree we have impact, and, and, and try to be responsible about this? You know, yep. uh, does, does PV um, occupy a large land mass and have some environmental impact, of course it does. Mm -hmm. can, it, can it be responsibly managed? We believe it can. Yes. Um, and, and it's the same thing with ARIES. I mean, uh, do you have an environmental impact when you lay railroad tracks? Yes, you do. But you know it beats the heck out of the alternatives. And, right. and you're realists. Yes, exactly. Very good. OK, and speaking of the math and science, here's another slide on that. Yeah, and, and I, you know, just, just to say this very quickly, you'll have a couple slides like this. You know, for energy storage, uh, we, we can scale from 100 megawatts up to 3 gigawatts uh, pretty easily just by adding tracks, cars, and masses. Um, we, we could actually build them smaller for isolated areas. Uh, generally, though, we, we've not considered that yet simply because the costs rise because of the fixed cost of track, for example that has to be spread over the output. So mm -hmm. could, you build, could you build one that was 5 megawatts for an isolated town? Yes, you could. It would just cost more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, storage duration, you can configure this 2 to 24 hours. Response time, 5 seconds to full charge, 25 to full discharge. And the reason it takes that long is simply that you have to cue the car and move it onto the slope and get mm -hmm. it running. Right. As you can see, this is a very conservative assumption here at 78.3%. This is at the bottom of our model deficiency. If we optimize the vehicles, if, for example, you use electric locomotives that have been purpose modified for Aries, so you get rid of a lot of the excess stuff that we don't need because we don't transport people, for example, if you optimize the motors, if you if you purpose build areas, the efficiency can go up above this. But we can do a 78 plus percent efficiency using what we call COTS, commercial off the shelf okay. equipment. So the uh, thing that you're working with in the Tehachapi used to be, you know, used to be on the Southern Pacific. No, actually, what we've done in Tehachapi is we uh, we thought it was appropriate that uh, we we built a thousand foot track. Uh, in a place called Victory Springs Ranch, which is in the center of a very large wind farm. Okay. It's a beautiful slope, and there's a beautiful ranch house there owned by a, a man named Jim Dielson, who's the father of the American wind industry. He founded Clipper Wind and, yes, I, and I very, very uh, renowned uh, uh, renewable energy guy. And he was kind enough to let us build our test bed uh, actually on that site uh, in the midst of the wind farm. We, we feel good about that, and we're, and we're using a, uh, a small electric locomotive with a relatively modest mass. It's only a 10,000-pound car, uh, which is small by area standard, sure. to, to 
test bed and work on our power electronics and so forth. Mm-hmm. Well, that's fantastic. All righty, here we go. Okay. And now this one, uh, uh, we only put this on here because we hope that your listeners will actually go on to the ARIES website, learn a lot more about our technology, and actually watch a movie which shows you simulations of, of ARIES in action and gives you more information about the technology. So we kind of commend that to everyone. Click on the website learn a little bit more about what we're trying to do. We've also got an opportunity there where you can ask questions or direct inquiries to us, and we'll do our best to answer them. Mm-hmm. And is it um, it's AriesNorthAmerica.com, is that correct? It is. It is. AriesNorthAmerica.com. Okay, good. Okay, a little bit more on this. Yeah, now this is the, uh, the smaller ancillary services or regulation system. Um, there's a lot of acronyms on here that are more specific to the California market. But basically, this simply says that we can put in single track area systems to provide critical grid support functions, which are increasingly necessary now as we lose more and more of the old fossil fired units. And a lot of people say, hooray, we're getting rid of coal and we're getting rid of oil and we're getting rid of in, in, in Southern California natural gas burning units, which are all polluters, they're all emitters. But the problem is when we lose them, we lose stability. And people who understand a little bit about the physics of the electric business realize that we're losing the ability to maintain stable voltage and frequency and inertia, inertia required to to keep the system stable, as well as bar support that helps the power move around the grid. So we can actually put back into the system in a clean way those same physics characteristics that were provided by fossil, fossil burning plants. Yes. And speaking of fossil burning plants and gas peaker plants in particular, it strikes me that when you talk about um, storage and, and grid support in this context, you're really talking about the – you're talking about the cost versus a, a an incremental peaker plant. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, certainly one way to look at it is is to say, well, why don't we just build a lot of combustion turbines burning natural gas all over the place? And whenever we have a, a shortfall uh, as a result, for example, of renewable power being down, right, the, the, the wind isn't blowing, there's a cloud bank, uh, it's nighttime. Could we fire up combustion turbines and provide uh, both the, the physical characteristics and the actual energy needed by the grid? Yes, you could. And believe me, with incredibly cheap natural gas, historically cheap due to fracking and so forth, um, you're never going to compete uh, on, a, on a pure cost basis with just burning fossil fuel. The problem is you're just burning fossil fuel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're, we're saying at some point a choice must be made because the solution can't always burn to burn more fossil fuel and create more emissions. Okay. And if you, if, if, you, if you want to get off that diet, then you've got to go a different direction. Yes. Okay. Now, you're avoiding the idea of, of cost specifically. Are you doing that? Do you, do you want to say anything about this thing? Is this, this thing wouldn't, if this thing were fantastically expensive, we, I don't think you would have taken a, a, a perfectly wonderful you know, 38-year career and gone into something kind of inane. You, right. <laughs> go ahead. I, 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 will, I will tell you, well, there, there obviously is, is some stuff here that is proprietary and Aries is in negotiation with multiple parties right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, will, I will tell you that our capital cost is substantially lower than the cost of pump storage hydro, and the cost of pump storage hydro is considerably lower than the cost of the alternatives like batteries or flywheels. Right. So we're we're the, we're the cheapest dog in town. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we are cheaper on a capital cost basis than any of the competing alternatives, uh, and and considerably cheaper uh, than pump storage hydro. Mm-hmm. Good. All right. And here we've got a slide that talks about um, that gets into a little bit of these ancillary services. In this case, frequency regulation. 
Exactly. I mean, this one is, is more designed for the techies among your listeners, but it simply says that we have the capacity here using regenerative braking of the shuttle units as they move downhill and then using uh, uh, the motoring capability of them as they move uphill to actually oscillate up and down the hill on command to perform frequency regulation. And when you look at it, any, any of your listeners who go onto our, our website will actually see a, a computer simulation here of a system operating as a frequency regulation machine. And it, it always reminds people of that game that you, you remember as a kid where you had the steel balls all hanging from cords and you pulled the one out on the end and released it and the one on the other end went out. Yes. And, and what, what you see with uh, ARIES being used as, as, a, as a regulation or ancillary services machine is a bunch of ARIES cars queued up mid-slope and they start peeling off going downhill when the system needs frequency or voltage support. And if the system should suddenly, the grid should become over frequency or over voltage, you see the cars on the other end start to move up slope. So you're constantly moving, like an accordion, cars up and down to maintain the stability of the grid that normally would have been provided by a spinning turbine generator f fueled by gas or oil or coal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Here we go. Next slide. Yeah, now this is, this is simply a little bit more detail, probably more than you need, about uh, a, a fast response, what in California we call a REM, a Regulation Energy Management Facility, which needs ancillary services. This would be a typical configuration where we'd have, we'd have a 2,000 foot elevation differential at 9% maximum grade. We can do it at less. The mass would travel a length of, of about 3.5 miles on a single track, We'd, we'd have just eight four-car shuttle trains. They never exceed 16 miles per hour. So uh, you, know, you could run alongside them if you're fairly quick. And we'd simply uh, uh, respond to the commands, in this case to the California ISO, for example, for uh, uh, ancillary services. Um, so this is, this is not a huge installation. This is a narrow right-of-way yes. that you would see for a single train going up and down. Okay. Makes sense. And um, so the numbers there? Yeah, here's, here's the numbers for, for an ancillary services machine. Again, you can go smaller. These are fundamentally smaller because they're single track insulation, installations, rather 10 to 200 megawatts. Um, you know, shorter duration to stabilize the grid, less than 10 seconds to come up to full power uh, to start to, to go right down less than four seconds, one-way efficiency over 90 percent, uh, 13 seconds from full, to less than 13 from full charge to full discharge, uh, no standby storage losses. This is an interesting thing. With most storage technologies or ancillary services technologies, uh, if you don't use them once they're charged, they dissipate. For right. example, electric chemical or battery solutions dissipate over time. Once we move the masses up the hill, you can go away for a, a, an hour or a week or a month or a year and the stored energy remains exactly constant. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Good. So why don't we summarize and then I have a business question for you. But anyway, you wanted to speak here about the overall kind of summary of advantages, yep. I think. And, and I, I think we've hit most of these scalability uh, we can make it the right size for the needs of the grid, and we can expand it in size as more and more, hopefully, as more and more renewables are, are integrated into the grid over time. Uh, there are lots of site options. They're abundant, particularly in the arid regions, which tend to be the regions that have the best wind and sun. So there's a good fit there. Uh, we fit best in the areas where the wind blows a lot and the sun shines a lot. Yep. Uh, and typically, Another lucky thing for us, good fortune, is that in those areas where the wind blows a lot and the sun shines a lot, renewable developers build. And when they build, they have to build transmission. So we can simply piggyback off transmission in the, in the areas that are best suited to Aries. Okay. Um, unlike most storage mediums, we have a constant efficiency over the full range of power output. It doesn't, it doesn't change 
as the battery is discharging, for example, or the flywheel is running down. The efficiency is the same all the way through the range. Very high efficiency, um, low capital cost. This is the only number you'll see here. I'm, I'm putting the, letting the cat out of the bag a little bit. About 60% of the capital cost of a hydro pump storage hydro facility. Very low levelized cost per kilowatt hour, and no use of water. Right. Very good. Well, and here's the business question that I followed. I'll just put on this um, thank you slide here. Um, my question for you is, tell us a little bit about the state of corporate development here. Do you, do you need more investors? Do you need more uh, you know, strategic business partners, more contacts at you know, different levels within uh, v various phase of various aspects of the public or private sector? What, what, do, you, what do you need? Sure. Well, thank you for that. We, you know, at, at this point, we've been entirely uh, internally funded, including our demonstration project, uh, by a group of dedicated, pretty visionary investors. You've met some of them. Yep. Uh, and these are people who, who uh, in large part, have long histories uh, with uh, the environment and with renewables and, and have a commitment to doing this. Uh, but certainly now we're at the point where we are uh, actively looking for strategic partners to build the first commercial installation. We have a site, we have a host utility, we have enthusiasm, uh, tremendous enthusiasm from the state government. We have support uh, from the legislature, uh, and uh, that first commercial project will be located in Nevada. It will be mm -hmm. connected, connected to the California ISO as well as the Nevada grid. Uh, and we are now looking for strategic partners to invest in that first project uh, and help us uh, make this ultimately a global reality. Well, <clears throat> if you're willing, I guess I should have gotten your permission to do this before we started, but if you're willing, why don't you t sell me that? In other words, are you looking for, it sounds like this would be a job for project financing, debt, equity, very straightforward garden variety stuff if certain conditions were in place in terms of um, the, the uh, takeoff agreement, as an example. Um, yeah. Having said that, I, I'm not that it's the end of the world if that's not in place, obviously. I think this, this whole thing makes a great deal of sense, and the better connected you are, it's the, you know, the governor's office or whoever you're talking about, about the, the heads of state government, the better. I mean, I'm sure this is exciting, regardless of how complete the package is. But do you do you want? I mean, if you don't mind telling me about that, go ahead. Sure. Well, I, you know, you you have pointed out one of the great challenges right now that we face in when we look at 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 the at the grid writ large and renewables, which is there's a, a tremendous acceptance at the federal and the regional and the state level uh, of, of the critical need for storage going forward. However, because this is, a, is really an, a, sort of an infant market as we go forward, the problem is that until very, very recently, uh, until a, a February landmark decision by the California Public Utilities Commission, there hasn't been a way out there to really get a financeable vehicle, an, an off-taker agreement, if, if you will, right. for storage. Um, uh, the, the federal government at, at the FERC, as well as, as the regional transmission authorities, are, are, have open proceedings. They're working on it. Um, their goal, uh, they've stated to all of us many times, is to have storage services agreements that, that give sufficient financial certainty for people to actually go out and get project financing for storage. Um, but in the, in the short term, until those develop, and they are now starting to finally come to fruition, um, you know, the way you, you do the first ARIES project, which is an ancillary services machine in Nevada, is by taking advantage of the California ISOs ancillary services market that you referred to earlier, and you literally sell into both the real-time and the day-ahead market. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't yet fit. No energy storage fits the PPA model for wind farms or for 
solar photovoltaic or, or central solar thermal um, because there really aren't PPAs for storage yet, but they're coming. Okay. They're, they're, it work. I believe we're not too far from this. Um, having said that, I've always wondered about you know, th this is a problem, even if everybody, even if there were no lawyers trying to, you know, keep this from happening, um, even if there were, everybody was completely on board, at a minimum, you have the conundrum of how do you take an asset, in this case storage, that benefits a number of different constituencies. You've got generation, transmission, distribution, and load, all of which benefit in fundamentally different ways from the same asset. And then you have to say, well, who, A, who's going to pay for it and how? Um, and then you've got a little problem there, it seems to me. So this is a, you referred to as an infant market, and I'm sure that's apt. Um, but I'm also sure that we will eventually figure this out. As, as you know, litigious and, and bureaucratic as we tend to be in the United States about things, and especially about renewable energy, um, I, I suppose that's the bad news. The good news is this is going to happen. This is the the cost of uh, the levelized cost of energy, even in the absence of storage, is coming down for renewable sources. Um, the uh, the natives are growing restless about what we're doing to our planet, even in the United States, which tends to be a you know a laggard in terms of environmental sensibilities. But day by day, I see you know I read a lot of this stuff, and I'm sure you do too, and I see. Uh, there was some real progress being made in terms of people who a couple of years ago said, let's just, you know, let's just burn more fossil fuels. Um, even th that is becoming less and less tenable among reasonably well-educated people. Yeah, I, well, I think you're right, and I think it's it's overdue. Uh, you know, just a commentary, Craig, on on what you uh, what you said at the beginning of that uh, of that statement. Um, you know, we we ultimately have to have to look at storage. We believe, and this is a bit controversial out there, as being sort of a different animal. Mm -hmm. Storage is not fundamentally generation, and if we're just going to go out and bid for generation with low price winning, we're going to get one hell of a lot of natural gas peaking plants. Mm -hmm. That's not what we need. That's not what we want. Fundamentally, storage is a grid asset, much like building a transmission line that enables renewables to hook up to the grid. Mm -hmm. It's a grid asset that benefits everyone. And we believe that storage is properly considered not generation, but a grid asset that enables renewables integration that should be then spread over all customers on the yes. grid using some kind of a uniform surcharge as a grid enhancement. Yep, not, exactly. Not not as a generator, because we're not a generator. That's no, I we're... understand that. If I implied that, I misspoke. Well, that's fantastic. From your lips to God's ears, as they say in, you know, cliche land. <laughs> well, we thank you so much for your, for your time, and we thank all your listeners for, for uh, devoting some of their valuable time to this. We hope they'll look into the website. We look forward to their inquiries, even the critical ones. Uh, this has been an amazing journey for all of us. I can only say that our commitment here, uh, while we'd all like to make a buck, uh, that is what part of what makes the world go round, the commitment for all of us here is that we want to do something that really matters. We really want to do well by doing good, and that's what Aries is about. That's our first priority. None of us uh, are looking forward to, uh, to getting rich, but we are looking forward to trying to help change the world. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic stuff. And, and just in closing, anybody wants to get a hold of Jim, obviously if you hit the contact button on the Two Green Energy website and just let me know, I'll connect you immediately with him. Or just go to the Aries website and take it from there. Jim, yeah. thanks very much, my friend. Good to speak with you. Um, extremely well done, and uh, Godspeed. Thank you so much, Greg. We appreciate you and your listeners. Okay, now. Bye now.